Ninjas and Ninjets. Welcome to the third episode of Ninjas with Altitude uh, with me, Drew's News. And today's guest needs no introduction, or at least most people that know him anyway. Uh, he's Paul Capsi, and he's Howdy. joining us from Algarve. Paul, how are you doing, man? Yeah, really good, Ant. Huh? Really good. Awesome. Uh, it's looking nice and sunny out in the Algarve. How hot is it? Uh, I'm not going to complain. It's uh, 22, 23, something like that. Nice, man. Yeah, it's all well, right. In sunny Newport at the moment, it's nine and a half degrees. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I'm glad you're enjoying, uh, enjoying the time over there at the moment. Obviously, we're not doing much. So, thank you very much for your time today. Um, what I'm hoping to get through with you is something along the lines of drawing from your uh, free fly expertise and your tunnel coaching and your AFF instructing, um, your national championships, your... Uh, World Cup performances and sort of all of this vast knowledge to hopefully take us on a journey through time and space, through uh, <laughs> through the origins of free fly. So, um, but first, before before I get into this, I wanted to share something uh, pretty cool, um, and just to share the background of the story behind it. I can remember uh, in 2015 when I I was pretty new to the tunnel, and obviously for those of uh, you that don't know either of us. Um, Paul was um, an IBA tunnel instructor uh, back in the day uh, when I was, I must have been about 13 or 14, I think, Paul, um, mm -hmm. in air kicks in Milton Keynes. And then in 2015 is when I became an instructor um, in air kicks, but based in Stoke. Uh, so uh, sort of we have the same sort of career path through the tunnel. Um, and I know obviously you've progressed on there yeah. to... Uh, well, you've left the tunnel behind. Uh, yeah, I can see why, actually. Well, I did, you know, I did 11 years working in, the, in, the, in wind tunnels. And um, you know what? It's, it's, it's sort of given me everything. Um, but originally, I got into all of this because I wanted to skydive. And, and uh, there, was, there was a point where I knew that it had to come to an end, the tunnel stuff. Okay. Uh, so that I could actually focus on what I, what the original whole plan was. Okay. Um, so two years before I started working in the tunnel, so first, first skydive 2006. Right. Uh, and then um, I basically went full steam ahead in America, uh, jumping my socks off, came back broke, <laughs> uh, saved up for six months, went back out, came back broke, you know, three months of <laughs> stints over there at a time, just blasting out a load of uh, belly four ways mostly. Yeah. Um, and I got to 400 jumps doing that. And I was in line for becoming USPA AFF instructor. I was only really uh, 100 jumps off having enough jumps. Okay. And, you know, then there was this huge realization of you know what it's it's a thousand jumps to be a bpa instructor 500 for uspa have i really got the ability to sort of do another 500 jumps uh to, to become the u uh, the, the bpa instructor and it just kind of got to a point where you know i wasn't going to be moving to america and becoming an instructor that that wasn't going to happen. Other things in life, family and everything weren't, weren't going to sort of mean that that was a fair option. So I thought, well, let's, let's try and stay in the UK and stay in the, stay in the sport somehow. Yeah. And then I had an interview at, at uh, Air Kicks. And one of the first things I saw there was Adam Matacola <laughs> coaching someone free flying. And I thought, you know what, I've now got a new, a new goal, a new mission, which is, you know, full steam ahead to, to attempt to, to, to be able to coach people myself. Yeah. Um, having a life of being self-employed, never really been that keen on, on sort of. Working for the man. Yeah, kind of, you know. Yeah, fair. And so I knew that. I knew that needs to be a mission to sort of become independent with, with my, you know, the tunnel, the tunnel coaching and stuff. And I wasn't ever really going to be like a career tunnel 
okay. know, instructor that wasn't going to happen. So I used the tunnel, the tunnel instruction very much as a, like an apprenticeship, um, build up the skills. And then there's this massive string of, of lucky events. Like I can I'm, prob it. I'm probably the luckiest guy I know quite seriously <laughs> in every respect, but, um, a series of lucky of lucky events uh, place in uh, euphoria came up yeah um they had some sponsorship which meant that i could get some you know get jumping again yeah. um which is something as a tunnel instructor uh you can't really afford to jump not as no. an instructor i'm afraid no i i, I relate to that yeah i mean i remember literally for two years not being able to even afford my my uh, bpa membership that, yeah. that's that, that's kind of how it was i agree <laughs> um and then this place came up in the team um and you know thankfully dave sort of you know asked me and we went from there and i think i was kind of in a stranger scenario to to most of the guys there because i actually did have you know 400 jumps under my belt and i had some skydiving experience it wasn't necessarily a lot of free fly in the sky experience at okay. that time but it was at least skydives whereas a lot of other people there you know hadn't even done their uh, aff so yeah yeah they're in a they're in a different scenario to me that made me perhaps slightly more attractive to the team fair i, I can kind of relate to that a little bit because um i i got my tandem rating about two weeks before i started in the tunnel but I, I had been skydiving for uh, six years. I had no interest in free flying, Paul. Um, like I can remember when I started, and we all, well, we both know Zach Nicholas. Um, on my first day, I said I can remember saying to Zach, I, "Oh man, I can't wait to be a belly ninja," and he just laughed at me. And he's like, "No man, you're gonna be an everything ninja." And I'm yeah. like, no, "No man, you don't understand. Like I I just want to be good on my belly." And he's like. Uh, maybe you're in the wrong job pal <laughs> and then uh, to be fair I obviously through the job and the exposure to the sheer amount of time and I think obviously you saw my progression pretty much from start to finish um, I just really bloody enjoyed free flying when I started to learn it so I'm glad that I did that because you're saying you can't afford to jump as a tunnel instructor um, yeah I completely agree with that but I was lucky that I had my my weekend job in Redlands where um, well, you used to film me regularly, and I, I was going to hey, put this. Epic. Yeah, the, man, those days were <laughs> mega. I was going to put this in the introduction, um, and I was actually going to say that you are the only videographer I've ever seen to be able to fly and film a tandem head down, uh, with particularly me. I'm ten stone soaking wet, jumping a strong, <laughs> which has the gigantic drogue, <laughs> and you're managing to fly head down in front of me and. Like, this is something we'll get on to um, throughout the podcast about obviously jumpsuit selection, but, um, but the, and it's going to show that the, you know, a big baggy jumpsuit, if that's what you want to do, um, you know, you can fly that slow in a static head down position. Um, and again, I'll, we'll see in some videos as well later on where uh, Olav Zipser, he's doing layouts through, uh, a big belly or two belly rounds isn't he like a figure eight yeah and yeah. uh you know and he would never be doing that with with these super tight jumpsuits that uh obviously are like prevalent nowadays so it, it goes to show that it's um part of also being a good instructor you know uh, using the right equipment and like you've got a toolbox full of equipment and that that equipment that you use to fly head over tandems man is the best <laughs> simple sorry yeah. so i diverted a little bit there but i can relate you know yeah yeah but actually just going back to your sort of thoughts on just being the uh, the belly ninja in the tunnel mm -hmm. um i was exactly the same as that because yeah. um i got to something like 300 jumps in america and although i had a bit of a crew there that we were doing regular four ways with every now and then someone would have to go and go to work, which is really mm -hmm. inconvenient. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was there at the drop zone sometimes on my own and I wanted something that I could do to sort of, you know, jump on my own, which is really the origins of how free flyers developed. It's, you know, what do you do when you're on your own? You're not yeah, just going to jump out and, 
do some belly jumps. So, yeah. you know, you're going to try and get into, you know, different orientations and things. So, um, I then went ahead and had 15 minutes of tunnel free fly coaching, my first experience in the tunnel, 15 yeah. minutes. And I, I now know that it, it, it's, it, it, it wasn't me that was totally <laughs> useless. I was probably totally and utterly useless. But yeah. um, my first experience of a coach was it, he was going to, you know, introduction to back fly. Yeah. He turned up two minutes before we got in, um, which I now know is nowhere near a long, long enough brief. But of yeah. course, you have no idea. You know, if someone says, yeah, yeah, that's plenty of time. It's quite easy. This is the position. It's like, yeah, okay, seems basic enough. And I've got in there. And at any point, he could have redeemed himself at any point. <laughs> but basically, it was 15 minutes, two and a half minute rotations of going in there, scooting around the, the tunnel, bing, 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 banging bing, off the wall. Yeah. Um, and then when we came out, it wasn't like he said, hey, man, do you know what? You could do a bit of this and do a bit of that and try this and try that. He just said nothing to me whatsoever. And then when we, when we finally got out after the 15 minutes, he said, uh, he's, he, he didn't say, okay, let's go and have a look at the video and a, do a debrief or, you know, any of that. It was, his words to me were, do you want to book some more time? <laughs> yeah. And, <No. laughs> and I said, and I said, are, are you, are you serious? Because to me, that was the biggest waste of 15 minutes I've ever yeah. spent. Yeah. Yeah money it was a waste of my time your time and even if you gave me 15 minutes for free right now i, I, I wouldn't I, i'd rather literally enjoyable. anything else like i have i cannot see any light at the end of this tunnel <laughs> at all like the, the, there is no tunnel ending it just it's just dark <laughs> yeah. uh, from the very beginning to the very end i've gained absolutely nothing Right. So he said, oh, don't be like that, mate. You know, people progress at different speeds. He said, look, do you know what? I'm a, I'm a reasonably, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the kind of guy that will stick at something if I think that there's that, that, that I can do it. Yeah. But I just know that this is mentally beyond my capacity. Whatever it is, my brain cannot deal with you know anything else except being on its belly definitely back fly out the question and any chance of flying in a sit or a head down just forget it it's yeah. never going to happen for me i know when to give up and <laughs> in another 15 minutes i know i'd be no better in another 15 hours i'd be no better i cannot do it yeah and uh, <laughs> and uh, he, he was probably quite surprised at that but that was my first experience you know yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so when I first sort of got the job in the tunnel, I really did just think that I was going to be, you know, I'll, I'm going to be the belly guy. I'm going to be really, really good at belly because that was, that was what I'd already done a reasonable amount of all the, yeah. all the four it's ways. Stuff. On it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it is amazing how your experiences first off like that can completely put you off and you would have seen it in the tunnel as well the odd occasion where someone's sort of getting some coaching and you're like wow this guy's not gaining anything yes and if we ever see him again i'll be very surprised and, yes you know sometimes we don't you know people do that that first introduction to backfly it's really hard work um there's nothing fun For about sure. it for sure. And, uh, yeah. And then we never see him again. Yeah. That <laughs> like, that happened, that I'm just going to gonna stick with doing whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I did, uh, I did 20 minutes or 40 minutes, I think with Ali Milne, um, when I first started jumping, but for, you know, fair play, like, like yourself, Paul, um, obviously I've worked enough with you over the years. Um, and actually I've taken a lot from your briefings into my briefings, you know, as we all do, we learn off each other and we help each other. Um, and, uh, Ali is very much uh, the same. You know, we do like to give these nice briefings and obviously hindsight's a beautiful thing. If you had known that back in the day, you would have realized 
just how extremely bad that that particular coach was. Um, mm. But yeah, it's and I think like like that really is important to to have that level of uh, commitment to teaching people that you want to give them as much as possible because a well it it, it just helps all around a they're more likely to enjoy it. If they're more likely to enjoy it, they're more, more receptive to learning and therefore they're going to actually fly better. Um, and obviously, lastly, then, you probably don't even need to ask them, would you like to buy some more time? They're probably going to say to you, right, that was fucking awesome. And can I, when can I make the next booking? When are you next available? <laughs> yes, 100%. Um, but we're, uh, we're, we're always uh, like learning off each other. I mean, sometimes we'll look at someone who's been you know, in a sport for a long time. Um, and we sort of think, well, what is anyone going to teach them about coaching or teaching someone? But yeah, every now and then someone who's, who's often quite, even quite new to the sport will say something to a student. I'll be like, wow, that was a bit of genius. How, you know, how we sort of making that guy think of, you know, approaching something in a particular way. Yeah. And, you know, and I'll go up to the guy and go, mate, that's a bit of genius. Do you mind if I like borrow that every now and then? Cause that's going to really work for, for some of my students. That's mad. Um, so yeah, we're always, we're always like stealing off each other a little bit, you know, different techniques. Yeah. But I don't think we should feel bad about that. You know what? It's, um, it is no, always I'm... about trying to give, the student the most for their hard-earned money for sure. um, and 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 i think those those guys out there who are just a bit too proud to uh take any extra advice from from someone no matter how new they are to the sport yeah they're actually missing out on some some real tricks on how to be better themselves 100 percent, man um i believe from high fly training um tunnel instructors um are probably some of the strongest belly flyers um in the world because i did, did you i'm sure you must have had uh like drive stops where um you know your, your trainers trying to literally full-on track as hard as they can into the wall and you're, yeah. you're on your belly using your pitch using your knees and you know like you definitely get such a strong feeling yeah. on your belly, don't you? And it's actually well, that's like, what kept it interesting, isn't yeah, it? At man. the end of the day, you know, yeah, it's man. like, wow, that was a real, <laughs> that was really yeah. hard, which man. sort of makes it really interesting. Yeah, and like uh, you know, all through my instructing, uh, coming out after high fly training early in the mornings with uh, JD Davis, um, those were some of the rare moments where I came out of the tunnel absolutely buzzing because there had been the best session. You know, don't worry about all this learning to fly head down. I strongly recommend high fly training because it's the yeah. most fun I've ever had. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so how did then um, going from starting in air kicks um, in Milton Keynes, how did you actually get to winning? the um, Free Fly A National Championships. And, and what year did you win? Was it 2012? I uh, don't remember. You know I'm probably going to get this wrong. Um, I don't know if it was no. 12, 13, or 14, to be honest. Oh, okay. And right now on the screen, it's flashing up with the thing. And I should have done my research <laughs> properly, and I should have known as well. So right now it's flashing up, man. Uh, but anyway, how, how did you get to, um, obviously, from starting in the tunnel then, like you said, Dave, Dave uh, Pacey approached you, you joined the team, and then take us from there, you know, what, what was the sort of process of um, building up your, your, your drills for your uh, compulsories, and then subsequently the free routine? Well, I'll tell you what, it was the most... Um humbling experience because uh obviously dave had far more skydives and far more free fly experience in the sky um in the tunnel i was arguably a stronger flyer than than him albeit he's got very much his own style for things but when you sort of go from this you, you imagine that you're going to be able to just get into the sky and your free fly skills are just going to transfer straight away. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you've got someone that you're training with in the wind tunnel and you're thinking, okay, well in a wind tunnel, I feel like I'm the stronger flyer. So this is going to be easy in the sky. 
and then you get into the sky and suddenly you know, you're all over the sh you're all over the place and the yeah. big the big one is that in in the wind tunnel we get very very used to uh reference points mm. and that is what we use very often for all sorts of things you know use it for for transitions and yep uh the fact that the wall is there means that if you're moving forwards at all you're not going to move forwards very far yes in the sky if you start moving forwards you don't know you're moving forwards <laughs> that's it yeah um and then you've got this notion of the the wind tunnels always at a set speed so yeah. when you're working with a, a free routine that's at one speed um Dave yes. Pace had the foresight to know that the judges weren't that that's not very impressive you can only do a certain number of moves and make something so interesting yeah if it's at one speed it has to have lots of speed changes so that you can do different types of stuff in the in the free routine so that for me was very unusual to go from being on my head being on my belly uh on my back yeah you know, changing all of these speeds all the time um was really really humbling and it i reckon that it took possibly the first 50 training jumps for me to properly feel like i was i was up to dave's standard in the yeah. sky and even then i wasn't um yeah, even then I wasn't really, but I was certainly, you know, I was maybe approaching it. I was approaching yeah. it. My, my wow. tunnel skills were starting to sort of change over. And I've had it before where um, I had one of my students, he, he hurt his shoulder and so he couldn't skydive. And he then did a whole load of coaching for about a year. And by the end of that, doing regular sessions every other week, he was flying on his head, whizzing around, transitions everything else and then he could start skydiving again and he um it, it is surprising to see someone who's extremely competent in the sky take roughly 12 jumps you know between 10 and 20 jumps to transfer their tunnel skills into the sky and once wow. they've done it it's like oh wow you know now i now i feel in control yes but until they've done those jumps, you know, and bearing in mind, you've got to think that, let's say you had, you had right, okay, I'm back in the sport because I've hurt myself and I've done this tunnel work while I've not been able to deploy a parachute, maybe a right arm's weak or something like that. Yeah. Got all these tunnel skills. Now I'm going to get into the sky again. Um, if you say to someone, okay, 10 to 20 jumps, to get you back in the sky firstly they won't believe you yeah they won't believe it's going to take that many jumps to transfer and then just because they've been doing all the transitions with references and transitions just jump after jump after jump i can't get the transition can't get the transition so then you actually teach them completely new transitions that they've never used before so the one i would teach someone if they were uh never done any tunnel at all would be a sit to head down front flip into onto their head okay now that is quite controversial but it works I bet. far far quicker because yeah because you you can actually you know look down at the ground at that point from an inner sit position and yeah. as you go over keep looking at that point on the ground ah, so yeah. then then the individual's got the reference and, and, that, and, and that's, the, that's the big difference. They're also going through the belly, which is something that they're familiar with, right? Everyone's familiar yeah. with flying on their belly, whereas going through the back is very unfamiliar. Okay. Um, but just to, just to finish up on, on that, in the UK, if you sort of said to someone, okay, it's going to take 12 jumps. If they had a really good weather day, and they managed to get six jumps in on the Saturday and six jumps in on the Sunday, which let's face it is unheard of it's tough. Uh, in the UK. Yeah. Um, and they still haven't transferred their skills. They're going to feel like they've had, they're like, wow, you know what? Can I really do this at all in the sky? Yeah. 
Exactly. And of course, the reality is they're not going to get those 12 jumps in in the weekend. That would be just nope. too much. To, that would be too much good luck. Yeah, so then sure. it's like it's two, three, four weekends. And if you said there's a month's worth of weekends before you're going to be able to fly like you do in the sky, in the tunnel, uh, in the crying. tunnel, life, blah, blah, um, they would be like, they'd be crying, wouldn't they? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I was going to say an interesting point, I, I, at least this is, of, this is opinion, um, but I think you're talking about using reference points in the tunnel um, for transitions, and this is why people struggle in the sky. Um, I think from a psychological point of view, we learn a lot easier with our, with our eyes. But actually, when we're flying, it's as we know and we try to teach people, it's about the feeling rather than the visual. You know, um, and you see people in the tunnel again or in the sky flying in the completely wrong position, but forcing their, their eyes on their reference point, thinking that they, they maintain in whatever orientation or heading they are. Um, yeah. So I think the reason people also learn uh, in the tunnel that way, like you say, with the reference points, is we teach them the reference points until they build the muscle memory to start to learn the feeling. As, as we know, drilling things, repetitive, uh, repeating the same thing over and over again. All we do that is it's a yes to get the um, the new build the neuromuscular pathways from the brain to the muscle, um, but B it's also to get the feeling, and I guess the the, the two are linked. Um, I'd love to speak to a psychologist one day to, or a sports psychologist to kind of get really deep into that. But that's my sort of thoughts on my own learning over the years. It could be complete yeah. bullshit, but that's what I think. Paul. Um, well, uh, obviously that's that's totally right. The only thing I'd say is, I dare you to do a sit to head down backflip transition onto your head with your eyes closed. In the, in the tunnel. I'll do that, man. I'll do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Mate, please don't do it. Please don't do it. <laughs> I, t I tell you what I will do, right? I just, please just don't do it. Me. I'm not going to do I'll take the dare back. Don't do it. <laughs> man, please on, don't. It's on the <laughs> um, But I well we've all sort of done it you know on on weekend flying with the instructors uh, especially i used to fly a lot with big dan crawford um we used to fly and okay granted this is carving you know in, but we used to go in face and we used to fly in face snakes with our eyes closed um obviously we wouldn't dare come through the belly and do a layout or, or things like that but we do a quite a nice in face uh blind snake you know with our eyes closed yeah i, I reckon with a little bit of practice. And like I say, I'll take that challenge on board. Personally, I've just challenged myself, not you. Um, when, when I eventually get back to work, whenever that is, uh, I'll start a little feeling out process. And if I think it's possible, man, I'll drop you a message and I'll say, right, I'm going for it. Because um, I think that'd be pretty gnarly. If I could, if I could yeah. pull that off, duct tape my helmet up, and then boom, <laughs> sit the head down, backflip. How do you feel? I yeah, I... I, I I think with carving, you are, um, I bet that every now and then your, your heels just touch the walls a little bit. Exactly. And you, so you can and you know it. where you are. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, what, I, what I've done with, with some students in the past to, to sort of get that transfer from tunnel to the sky is I've got them in the wind tunnel. They've done the transition and then I've said, right now, close your eyes. And, and fly on your head until I give you a tap. Uh, now the tap means that you are flying towards the wall and you need to bail out of it. Yeah. Generally people, people can't fly in perfectly the center of the tunnel for more than sort of five or six seconds. No. Before they start to, to gently drift. And let's face it, you only need to move a fraction of a mile an hour and within, you know, five seconds, you're touching the wall. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You'll be su you'll be surprised how hard it's it be is. Difficult. It's you know, be difficult. sure, you'll you'll have a massive sense of feel there, but uh, we'll, we'll see, it, man. I might be yeah. right to checks my ass can cash. Um, <laughs> but, but so, talking to which, man, I don't know if you remember from back in Basingstoke, um, there was a young lad, uh, a teenager, and he was a return flyer um, named Thomas. And uh, he was blind. And Thomas, uh, I think between myself, uh, Zach, Jimmy and Dan, you know, a, a couple of us, we actually taught him to sit fly. Um, and he, he could sort of backfly in the tunnel. 
transition into a sit and then well obviously he would drift into the walls and things but he would be able to sort of push push off the walls obviously i think with head down yeah. that would take a fair while longer i think i think totally possible for somebody like thomas yeah um, but man he was such a legend i don't know if you remember him um no i don't think i do all right i'll I'll see if I can dig some video out. I doubt I've got any, yeah. but it was fantastic, man, to see him. And then, you know, you'd sort of work out all what I'm going to tap him, what, you know, what it means. And then the shake means that the lights are flashing. So I'm going to sort of gradually get you to the door. And man, it was like, you know, I can remember the first time he was flying for me, you know, and it's almost like, oh, it's got me right there, you know. <laughs> um, but it does yeah. go to show that, yeah, you, you can have the feel, albeit like you, you do need an instructor or a coach who's absolutely switched on um, yeah. to, be, to be able to keep you safe. You know, it's not something you can uh, mess around with. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, so there's your, uh, there's your uh, sit to head down front flip in the sky. I like it, man. It is quite sort of strange to think that. I've taken a couple of guys uh, while I've been out here who are sit flyers and they want to get into head down and using the sit to belly front, a uh, sit to head down front flip, they've managed to um, do the transition and hold head down, albeit um, a, a, uh, uh, a straddle kind of position yeah <clears throat> um in roughly 12 jumps wow okay so, so there's this one guy who did eight coach jumps and then four solos in between that and he would he hadn't done any head down before but he'd managed yeah. to do the transition and hold it. Now, not hold it for very long, no, but only still. for like three or four seconds. And, and then he had to go home, unfortunately. And this, this was also not a young guy. He was maybe 55, which, right, okay. you know, does mean that that's a, it's, just, it's a bit of a, bit of a slower, slower progression for, for someone like that. Yeah. Now, the difference is that if you take someone with tunnel skills already, when they finally break through that notion of being able to uh, get themselves on their head at all yep. in the sky, then suddenly it's like the whole world will open up to them. Because they, be whizzing already around. Have, they already have such a high level of control. Yeah. It's yeah. already taken care of. It's just this non-reference transition that, that yeah. is the crux. Like, yeah, for sure, man. I completely agree um, with you. <clears throat> Um, just sort of very briefly sort of like talking about like trying to do this stuff tunnel versus the, uh, the sky. I've had a number of guys now, um, who maybe had very similar experiences to myself when I first started to do that bit of free fly in America. They just, they just weren't getting anywhere. And they were okay. feeling it was very unproductive. Yeah. Um, again, down to the coach and everything like that. But how much? How many? How many sessions do you devote to that before you you sort of go right? Let's let's not do that. So when I did um, did this event or did done these events with Tim Porter. Yeah. Tim Porter's never ever been in a tunnel, so I've been learning a lot from him on how he goes about sort of teaching people because no matter how hard I try my initial reaction is to go well how did I learn all this stuff which was in the tunnel so I'm going to try yeah. to teach it all the same way there's no net to grab in the sky man yeah yeah <laughs> like, it's so difficult I've been picking his brains and listening to his briefs and sort of working on that now I'd already I'd already develop my own sort of system if you like of going yep. right someone's got no tunnel training whatsoever so i think i'm going to attack it by doing this this and this and i still use some of that but i also use a lot of a lot of tim porter's uh methods now yeah um and there is a there is a number of people out there who have decided that their skydiving training 
is not going to be anywhere near a wind tunnel. And that, that is slowly starting to happen. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Not with a lot of people. A lot of people still come with a load of tunnel skills and, you know, we work on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and go from there. But there's, there's a couple of guys out there who are like, no, I'm just, just going to work on this in the sky now. Like, That's they're, cool. they're managing to get enough out of it. Um, and it could also be other things like the wind tunnel just isn't very convenient for them. Yes, it's, but... it's a long drive away or, and or honest, they, they, they can't also... find someone that they gel with coach wise. Yeah. It's also um, quite expensive tunnel, even, even though relatively speaking, it's not as expensive as skydiving. Um, but you know, to, to really maximize the learning you do, as we both know, you know, you have to put regular time in. Um, mm. to, to make leaps and bounds in your progress. Yeah, you can constantly progress by doing small amounts of time, but to make that big, big leap, you do need to sort of get, get the time in. Um, so it can become expensive. And for me, that was the reason I didn't carry on. Um, it wasn't so much that I didn't in, enjoy free flying. It was just I couldn't offset it. Well, I didn't have any money to offset it against, if I'm honest. So I couldn't afford to invest in learning it. Um, yeah. So it's... You know, I, I did learn to sit fly in the sky, sort of on my own on those jumps and then with other friends um, and things like that. But, uh, but if, I think you can't, you can't beat a balance for sure. Like, yeah. And I think yeah. a balance, this is not so much between tunnel and sky um, now, but I'm talking purely sky. Uh, something I like that you said to me uh, a few years back is like when, when you are coaching, um, sometimes, particularly when somebody's at the beginning of learning something like sit fly, um, is like a one in three system because okay it'd be easy to do a one-on-one -on -one all day long and keep taking their money but at the same time you do want the student to progress and it as we know when we when we learn skills it's kind of like you have an introduction to the skill and then you practice the skill until you master the skills there's three stages so i guess like i said by a one in three system you you do some learning on jump number one and then they take the next two jumps the solos and then they practice what they've done. And you, know, you, you can still debrief video if they happen to have video or anything like that. Um, or you can still verbally debrief and get, ask them how they felt. Again, we're relating it back to the feeling. Yeah. Um, but then th they're gonna kind of, and they're not being bombarded jump after jump after jump with so much new information. At least they're getting time to process it and build again the yeah. neuromuscular pathways, you know? So that was something that, that I took on board from yourself back in the day. And I, te I do tend to use her in the tunnel as well with certain students. I say, okay, you're now at a stage where, um, yes, I can carry on coaching you and, you know, I'm happy for the business, but you're, you're going to benefit a lot more now by flying with other people and practicing the skills you've got. Get, get good at them and it'll also save you money and then come back to me and I'm going to start giving you more tools to put in your toolbox. Um, yeah, yeah. I find it's a really nice system and, and actually in the long run, um, it's not about the money is okay, the money's nice. And as long as I get enough to pay my bills, I'm happy. But for me, I love seeing those students progress. And this, my job, as far as I'm concerned, is getting the most out of my student, not financially, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it is kind of like, like students sometimes look at you a little bit strange when you say to them, hey, we'll do one jump and then you're going to go and do two solos yeah. to practice what you've worked on. And they've got it in their minds that they're convinced that, every single jump coached is going to be the best option. Yeah. Now that's not to say that if you had a million pounds burning a hole in your pocket, that you weren't, you're not going to gain a bit of bit of something out of having every jump coached. Correct. But it's, it's going to be catastrophically expensive. And also you're not going to gain as much as you, as you think. Um, I mean, we've, I've, I've gone down a number of different sort of avenues with, with this stuff. And I found that a day rate is, uh -huh. I'm, I'm not so keen on it because actually now you're devoted to the one person all day. Yeah. And you find yourself doing jumps with them where you're not giving them very much construct because actually what they needed to do is just to go ahead and practice for sure um so the, the the best thing in a way in an ideal world if you can ever have this scenario and i have it over in the algarve quite regularly where you have 
uh, say three students um, and you do you're doing it you're jumping all the time but you're doing the one in three jumps with them yeah they can watch each other's debriefs as well they can land they can say oh well on that jump I was doing this all the time you go right okay well that's because you need to you know extend your legs more or whatever yeah and they, they do the next jump and they go oh yeah that that really worked extending yeah, out worked uh, cool uh, that didn't cost anything you know it's just a bit of advice on the ground yeah uh, uh -huh. and of course the students look at look at it when you say uh, please just go ahead and do do one in jump one in three jumps with me that's the best thing they go you sure you don't want to do mm. every, every jump yeah uh, well uh, not that not, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> but, but also, it's, no. It's not good for you. It's not yeah, good. man, for sure. Uh, um, and I was going to say, I know also um, you, you've you've given a lot back to the sport, um, particularly since winning the Nationals. Um, and I know you've done a lot with uh, Blesma. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing with Blesma over the years, man, because I know I've seen it, but for, for the viewers, um, obviously, I, I think that'd be a nice little story to tell. Yeah, so... Um... One of the easiest things to do is to um, find a video on YouTube. If you go on to, if you go on to Paul Capsi, you'll find uh, the Blesma. There's a half hour uh, video, which oh. sort of really shows, shows the whole journey that these guys go through. Um, but in a nutshell, it was Dave Pacey's um, dream to get uh, servicemen and women who uh, never thought for a minute that they could go skydiving. Uh, because they've lost lost a limb, <clears throat> yeah, um, and actually get them skydiving. So it, it does it does a lot of things. So firstly, if you're in a scenario where you've 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 lost a leg, legs, arms, or whatever, if you if you think something is out of your reach, then you know psychologically what does that do to you? Because it's saying, well, that's out of my reach. And so all these other things are out of my reach. Yep. Because if we can actually say to them, well, skydiving is in your reach, then not just for the skydiving, whether they carry on with skydiving or not in the future is, is kind of irrelevant. It's more the fact that they've now got the notion that more things are within their reach yeah. and that there is, help out there and Blesma is one of those company uh one of those charities that that does trips and they mm -hmm. enable uh all sorts of activities that you would think wow someone really doing that activity with without any legs for example yeah, yeah they are you know it's, you can make it happen you just have to yeah. be a little bit inventive with it for so sure. we used to um we used to bring the guys to the tunnel uh, and they do roughly between one and two hours each. So when someone's missing a part of their body, they're obviously no longer symmetrical. So you have to effectively teach them how to fly uh, when, they're, when they're not naturally, yeah, when they're not yeah. naturally in balance. Yeah. Um, so and also, if you have no legs, then your sense of feel is completely different to someone with legs. Yes. You know, one leg, or if you're missing one leg, you on one leg you feel something, and the other leg you don't. Uh, the prosthetic leg is a different shape to your original leg. So how much you might push that into the wind. Some of these guys didn't, didn't even have a knee to push their leg into the wind. So yep. then we would, we would modify the prosthetic so that it could only bend so far uh, into roughly the, the, the shape that we were after. Then we'd adjust the rest of the body to suit that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we used to go out to Elsinore. Um, they do a number of tandems, really get used to free fall, overcome that initial side of it. And then uh, we'll get them into the jump program. Now, the jumps usually went fairly well, to be honest. They had a lot of that tunnel time. They already knew how to fly. It was all the jumping tend to go fairly well. Um, but if you've got someone who ha is, has, doesn't have any legs, for example, how do they land? So you've got to yeah. get them to land sliding 
right from jump number one. Of course. Now, you know what? It doesn't always go that well. <laughs> but Elsinore was so great uh, facilitating. Um, if anyone's been to Elsinore, it's, it's on a, a lake bed. Um, and Elsinore did a, did a fantastic job of plowing up a huge square. And it was like landing into, you know, foot and a half deep talcum powder. Oh, lovely. A bit, a bit muddy. Yeah. You know? not, not very clean talcum powder. It was, it was super, super soft. I mean, it couldn't have been a nicer landing area. Um, and they facilitated that for us every year. They used to plow that up and, and, and uh, make that happen for us. That's cool. And we'd get the guys and we just, you know, Dave Pace's experience uh, and the other guys we had on the team, Andy Myers, Kim Myers, uh, and all the other people that helped us over the years, always people with a lot of experience um, working on the talk down, getting people, you know, getting a student to accurately land at all, yeah, let alone flaring at the right height and sliding in <laughs> you know all these things are, are a real challenge yeah. um and we actually were pretty lucky no one really sort of had any major problems in no. fact um but a, and of course there's the, there's there's other elements of it, you know, Dave, Dave put all that time and effort in and then I joined in and I put a lot of time and effort in uh, and Edward Appleby took it, took it on as well and was, yeah. uh, you know, running it and doing a fantastic job. Um, if we'd have had someone actually hurt themselves worse than they were before, that's it. That's, yeah, the, end of of the, that's the end of the program. Yep. Um, and that sort of is obviously desperately sad for the poor guy that's hurt themselves. It's also desperately sad for all the people in the future exactly. who we're never going to be able to have that chance because it doesn't take much for, for, for uh, a charity or an institution to go, no, this is, this is too much. Yeah. And, and you um, can understand why they would do that given the circumstance, but um, you know, well, it's, it's been an amazing, uh, like I said, I've seen them in the tunnel, uh, over the years and it's it's even to just to watch you know to be stood in the door as an instructor to watch all this going on it's something special man and it's awesome like so thanks like i guess on a lot of their behalf um i, w I was going to ask maybe this guy was uh on blesmer um or came through and did his aff on Bles through blesmer um Stu Snedden, is that right yeah Stu wow. and uh alex, alex. Yeah, so a yeah, funny story were. about um, funny story about Stu. Um, I think you were there as well. It was actually where you are right now, Algarve, two thousand and sixteen, uh, FSU. Um, no, it wasn't FSU. Actually, it was jump school. What does FSU stand for, by the way? So, um, I'm sure it's ferocious skydiving unicorns. That's it. Yeah, that right? ferocious skydiving unicorns. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's exactly the alternative right. as well, the obvious alternative. Oh, well, I don't know about the alternative. All right, no, good, uh, good Christian. <laughs> um, but uh, Stu Snedden was out there, and it was, yeah, it was with Jump School, um, with uh, Jerry and Rachel, uh, obviously yeah. Jerry rest his soul. Um, yep. uh, uh, Stu caught his leg, his prosthetic leg, on the door of the uh, Dornier and landed without a leg. And, you know, it, obviously a funny story in itself <laughs> that, that he's lost his leg in free fall. Uh, yeah. He never expected to get it back. And I think within an hour, uh, somebody had delivered a prosthetic leg to the drop zone and still had his leg back. It was amazing. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and obviously potentially really dangerous as well. But so funny, man. I hope he doesn't mind me telling that story, but it was brilliant. The highlight of my trip. <laughs> yeah, well, it's one, one of the things actually that um, we had to sort of instill into the guys the. With, with prosthetics was they would always every time they would always say you're never going to get this leg off this leg is not coming off there's so much suction or you know the the way the pin coat goes the into the bottom of the leg whatever it is you know this thing is never coming off <laughs> um and 
it, it, it is going to happen unless you unless you have like alternative ways of strapping that to your body. Yeah, it, it is, and I've and I've known it. Um, and of course, the last thing anyone wants is a prosthetic falling through the sky. It's exactly. Hurt exactly. Yeah, yeah. is a, a real danger with that. Yeah, and of course you you've got pressure changes. So a lot of these things they they they're held on with suction. And you get pressure changes as you go up in the altitude and come back down again and everything else. Things loosen up, hot weather, cold weather, all that kind of stuff. Uh, our calves nice and hot, which is what we're, what we're here for. But, yeah. you know, that then makes people sweat more. And that's sort of something that, that people of course. do. So many account. variables. Yeah. And when you've got a prosthetic, which actually is a full leg one which goes which will go all the way so someone who's got a um, an above knee amputation yeah the prosthetic's going to go all the way up to the hips and what they haven't taken into account is the harness pushing against that prosthetic and trying to dig in there a little bit that then breaks the suction seal that then makes the leg fall off so right. you know anyone with a prosthetic who's absolutely convinced you're never gonna it's never gonna it come off little. yeah of um definitely needs to a, a assume it will yeah and exactly one day strap it up and you know make, have a system that's going to make sure that thing's not going to come off yeah. strap it up cupcake <laughs> <laughs> which uh and th that brings me on to sorry but uh my next a uh, little bit so also also revolving around the algarve um, I can remember you and Ali training in the in Basingstoke. Uh, I can't remember what year it was um, for a certain um, tailor or suit manufacturer, and you were you were uh, recording. A, are we allowed to say the name? Are, the, are we allowed I, to say the name? Or? I don't know, so I, I'll keep it off the air just in case. Um, okay, but okay. it rhymes with jacket. There we go. Um, yeah, that'll do. Does. Good enough. Um, and yeah, I watched you train in the tunnel wearing these suits. Um, uh, well, I tell you what, Paul, you tell us a little bit about it. And while you tell us about the, the advert, uh, I'm going to put it on in the background, okay? Yeah, cool. There we go, man. So um, we can kind of see here that we've got these uh, helmets on as well. Um, <laughs> the, the, the suit manufacturer, it was all about, it was all about showing the suits off. Yeah uh and the and the helmets as well um and this whole jump the idea is that we were going to be making a cocktail the name of which escapes me but it's sugar syrup uh lime juice and uh gin Ooh, uh, and yeah. ice in a shaker yeah uh so there's the shaker in the hand um love it and <laughs> And now this this swoop is Pete Allen. Ah, uh, yeah, it is too. Now, it was the three of you. Yeah, yeah. So do you see how there he caught the sea when it was yeah. flat? Yes. Because the sea isn't flat in the Algarve. It's, there's waves, and that's part. Yeah, of you can see you can see for. the background. Yeah. And so, yeah. So we they moved these seats into the onto the beach, and then there was this sort of you know the line. <laughs> down with the parachute and stuff you know it's class uh, man yeah, it's yeah, it fantastic fun it's absolutely uh, class how many um, or how much tunnel time and then how many jumps did it take so as usual with these things they they all they it evolves right so in the beginning um somebody approaches pete allen and they they want to they want to put a car out of an airplane <laughs> with two guys driving the car wearing your suits awesome you know what you know so, a place you can do that yeah <laughs> it's yeah, not the exactly. algarve <laughs> it's, it's not the algarve and because the the suit manufacturer is a british manufacturer they wanted a location which could be passed off as the uk um and if you're on if i've been on the south coast of the uk uh you know around Durdle Door area in dorset uh, the cliffs and all that kind of stuff with a slightly different colour. Oh, okay. They do have those like archways and all that kind of thing. I didn't know that. I've not been down that way, man. 
Yeah, worth going. Oh, worth okay. going. I will do it. Look up beer. Uh, I think it's B E E R as yeah. a village. Go down to the beach there. You'll see. You'll see some landscape not too dissimilar to 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 uh, to where that was. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they. So to to put a to put a car out of an aeroplane is um, you'd have to do that in um, in Lord Eloy. Day. Eloy. Yeah. That's it. They'll allow that to do that, but of course that's desert. It's never going to pass itself off. So then uh, Pete Allen was getting involved with, well, these are some other options. And then look at this stuff. We've got free fly. And we all know that the UK and Europe and the world is full of people that are more than capable of doing that advert. You know, yeah. it wasn't just, me and Ali Milne were the only two people that could do it. You know, there's, there's an awful lot of people out there. Um, he, Alan knew the two of us and he wanted to have work with a team that he knew. Okay. Um, and he knew that we could, we could deliver and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so then, then we were asked to, to sort of do like this free fly element of it and make the cocktail. <laughs> um, Pete Allen with his astronomical jump numbers and swooping experience um, was always going to do the swooping. Yeah, he's um, going to do the biz view, any man. Even if it's barely yeah. flat, even, anything, he'll do the biz view. You know, I can swoop. Um, Ali can swoop infinitely better than I can. Okay. Um, but Pete Allen can swoop. Yeah. You know, yeah. One of the best in the world, right? Exactly. Now, what was quite funny was they were working on the swooping part of it while me and Ali were doing the the free fly bit. Right. And and uh, we would do our jump go to altitude whilst dropping him off. Of course. On the beach, if of you course. Like. Yeah. Um, and he would come back absolutely drenched. I don't know how many suits he had, but basically his, he was landing in the water so often because to get the timing where the water was relatively flat for him to skim the foot like that, how on earth can you use time a swoop? Man, that's impressive. To do that. I'll you've play got, that again at this point. That's so impressive, yeah. man. You know, you've got your, you've got your setup heights and everything else. You can't, you haven't, can't go back up higher you can't nope. hold off for too long you can't really wait for a set nope. and all this kind of stuff to finish so he was coming back absolutely drenched <laughs> and then the the poor girl who was looking after the suits she was washing suits ironing suits because it was all about making the suit look good of course yeah and you know people would come back and completely drown <laughs> um man so, yeah it was quite quite an interesting thing we, we did we did a reasonable amount of tunnel time which uh, largely was me and Ali uh, flying with each other, which we hadn't done a lot of. Um, we created a routine. They were very keen on us having um, definitely being able to make the cocktail in the sky. Right, so okay. We actually had to definitely legitimately say we actually did make the cocktail. They were really, really... Uh, adamant that that actually needed to happen we couldn't just sort of fudge it so Good. we did make we made up a routine which made the cocktail we did that a couple of times um and although elements of that were used in the final thing really and truly what they want what they needed was uh like the basic shots you yeah know? I'm going to come in close. You're going to squirt the lime juice into the mixer. Yeah. Uh, and I had like an optic on the front of me. So oh, Ali Milne was coming in and like, you know, taking the optic thing. So we were upside. Uh, what will we do? Yeah, we were upside down with the optic. That's right. Uh, the right way up so that the liquid would actually, you know, so the optic oh. was upside down on my chest. Yes. So when we were flying. Comes head down it was you know the, the, the optic was going to work yeah um so then we did a whole series of jumps and the the guy that had filming it called wolfgang had this massive great big camera on his head it was it looked like a shark's fin effectively sticking above his head about this, this wow big. 
okay. camera. Um, I think they're called a red camera. Or something I was going like to suggest, that. was there a red? I know they they yeah. the mutts nuts like. Yeah. 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 So, super big, heavy unit, and he yeah. was trying to trying to fly with this thing on. Uh, and of course, me and Ali doing our routine that we've developed, yeah. and this this poor guy, this huge shark's been on top of his head, trying to Amazing. trying to uh, trying to fly it. It was obviously pretty tricky. Yeah. Well, um, I was talking to Rich, man. That's um, like flying camera is that's a complete skill on its own. Even taking like the camera sort of uh, like settings and all that out of the way, like actually flying camera, and that's what you did with Euphoria, wasn't it? Was uh, fly camera. Or you well you you performed and then you flew camera was it? Yeah, so I had um, I had two. I think no, I think it might have been three years of being a performer. Yeah. Um, and then the team, you know, the team sort of changed. Uh, me and Dave remained the same. We had uh, different people coming in every now and then. Yeah. Um, and Sean Freeman then joined the team and I kind of felt that although Dave was very, very, very happy to, um, to do camera, I felt very strongly that actually, uh, this, this is, this is Dave's team. Yeah. Um, and so I felt not only did I want the new challenge of doing camera, um, which I'm so glad that I did, uh, but I also wanted to. I also wanted Dave to be the be a performer. Yeah. Um, now, if you watched our rounds, you'll see that for uh, compulsory two, which is round five. Um, actually, Dave became the cameraman, and I became the. The performer really uh, in in just one of the rounds um, <clears throat> that was just really playing on on all of our strengths um, that's super cool though, man knowing that you can just swap roles to, to suit whatever you need to do that's super cool yeah man. yeah which is you know that's why it's a you know when they say free fly a it's a it, it's a it's a team of three because it really is a team of three yeah um, and you, you can you can switch and swap and it's quite quite sort of funny like many many years ago uh i won't mention countries or anything but um a team of absolutely mind-blowing flyers um were being filmed by a cameraman who just basically stayed on the side filming them yeah was very very curious why their score was so low they're coming near the, the end of the pack. They're like, what my guys are doing is far, far better than what all these other guys are doing, but we're scoring really badly. Okay. And, uh, and that was all because the cameraman just filmed it from the side and did nothing else. Never. Um, if, you, if you put in a cameraman who's moving around, switch eagles, you actually are the person who's making the team move around the sky. The yeah. team probably aren't moving very far. Um, yeah. Sorry, the... the dog's bark in a minute. <laughs> I think somebody's trying to murder us. <laughs> uh, could be the English coming over the bridge. <laughs> could well be, man. We're still in lockdown yeah. in Wales. It's crazy, like... <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. Sorry. Yeah, so, so that was kind of quite a case in point, really. Like, if your cameraman isn't... Um, super super proactive and I remember coming down from those jumps uh, having filmed the boys physically out of breath because of the amount of moving around the sky there is and the speed changes and what you have to deal with and being one step ahead of all those speed changes um, you have to you have to preempt the fact that they're going to go from head down to belly for example you have to already get high on it um and and already for them to come and meet you of course yeah anyway it's, it's a million things to do with 
with with camera probably another 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 interview <laughs> exactly uh, when, when you run out of people i'll come back and we'll have another one the, well, well to be honest paul we're going to go into a second one um as long as that's all right with you because um i i really wanted to pick your brains about um the evolution of free fly um like i wanted okay. to talk a little bit about uh, a personal hero and i'm guessing yeah i guess in um <laughs> <laughs> one of uh, one of your heroes as well, Olav Zipser, and you know, being a pioneer in, of free fly um, back in the, the 90s. Um, but I think that's going to be for episode four. Um, awesome. No worries. Well, in that case, um, uh, thank you very much for your time today, Paul. Um, and obviously, I hope everybody's enjoyed watching. Uh, if you have enjoyed watching, um, please don't forget, uh, hit the subscribe button down there somewhere, um, as it's going to help me to create more and better content for you. Um, there's also a link over there to uh to paul's uh channel give paul a follow as well because he's putting some uh, some really cool coaching videos out at the moment um so paul keep putting them out man because i'm watching them and i'm learning and taking <laughs> notes as well awesome well until next time man fly safe and i'll speak to you in an hour you too dude take nice care one. cheers bro ciao